Hey, what's up and welcome to the overview for MSMC Redshift. First off, I want to say a big thank you to those of you out there, well, all of you if you're watching this video, who picked up MSMC and I'm super stoked that you're here. I'm very proud of this material pack and I can't wait for you uh, to start using it and show us all the cool stuff you guys make. All right, so uh, this video is not going to dive too deep. It's really just a brief overview to kind of like uh, get you get you going, get you some ideas of how these should be used. And of course, there's going to be tons of other videos that I hope you watch, advanced techniques, uh, videos going over specific features. Uh, so let's jump in. All right, so the first thing I want to do is I'm going to go over to our content browser. I'm going to just arrow up to where I have MSMC. Let's go ahead and go into our list view and jump into MSMC Redshift. Cool, make that a little bit smaller, easier to see. All right, so what do we got here? We've got ceramics, we've got metals, we've got paper, we've got pattern blobs, pattern copper, pattern gold, pattern plastic, silver, blah, 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 and terrazzo stone, wood, color ramps, color swatches, color washes, demo scene. So we got a lot of stuff in here. And we're going to not go over everything in complete detail because I want this to be a really quick video. Plus, I want you to explore and play around. But I do want to touch on some major things here. So one of the major things here is you may have noticed there's a lot of pattern materials. And that is really one of the biggest parts of MSMC are the patterns. So I'm going to open up the plastic pattern uh, folder here. And I'm just going to go and split this out and look at this a little bit bigger. So MSMC ships with over 50 patterns that I made in substance, really fun, modern, almost modern, uh, mid-century modern in style, uh, inspired, and just like fun modern patterns that can be used in a number of different ways. So you can see here we're using them uh, like in a plastic material here, but we also have ones that are layered with gold, layered with silver, and layered with copper. And that's just so that you can quickly uh, drag and drop and see what these will look like in your scene. So um, what's going on here, though? Can Do I have to use this blue material, and will the pattern always be white? What if my job, you know, I don't, I don't want blue, I want a different color? Well, that kind of leads me into this next uh, subject, which is there is a quite a bit of different stuff here from what we did in the Everyday Material, material Collection, whereas Everyday Material Collection was pretty locked down, and everything was bitmap-based. So there wasn't a whole lot of ways to easily change colors, uh, and we changed that with MSMC. I'm very proud of that, the fact that we made it a little bit more editable for you. We heard that people want to add their own brand colors, especially for a pack like this, where it's going to be very important to add your own colors and your own uh, flavor to it, that I wanted you guys to be able to do that. So let's go ahead and drag in a material here. Uh, let's use, I don't know, let's do this dotted, I'm going to find one down here. Let's do one of these fun ones. Um, there's one in particular that I'm looking for. Uh... Yeah, this one will work. Let's just drag that guy in. All right, we're going to put this onto our shader ball. And there we have it. All right, so um, this is going to be a blanket statement for all of MSMC, which is when you dive into the nodes in Redshift and Arnold, you're going to be able to change anything, obviously, just like uh, EMC. You can get in there and tweak whatever you want. In fact, I encourage that. But you're going to notice that there are going to be nodes that are light yellow. And any light yellow node is going to be something that I expect you to be able to change, expect you to change uh, freely. Not that you can't change everything else. You could change all you want. In fact, I encourage it, like I said. But the yellow is going to, like draw your eye and be like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm supposed to manipulate these nodes right here. So in our case right now, we've got, uh, let's just zoom in here a little bit so we can see that a little bit better. We've got pattern color and plastic color, pretty self-explanatory. So if we change the pattern color, come in here, twirl this down, maybe we want to do like a, let's hope redshift doesn't uh, crash. Come on, redshift. Okay, there we go. Let's, oh, uh, there you go. Okay, cool. Uh, let's go ahead and give this like a bright green and then we're going to take the plastic color and maybe make it like a very light white plastic. So you can see quickly here you can start to add your own complete flavor to this pack and you can do this with a lot of different materials. In fact, there's a lot of materials that that you would expect, anyone that you would expect to be able to change the color, you will be able to change the color. And if you can't, we have a video for that. So again, check out all the other videos. We're going to have videos uh, giving you tips on how to change the bitmap color. And if you come across a material that you want to change the bitmap color, maybe the base color, but you don't have these nodes, I'm going to show you how to do that pretty easily. Okay, so... Um, that sort of is the, the foundation of, of, of what I wanted to show you. I do want to dive in a little bit deeper, though. Um, let's talk about colors. You may have noticed 
as I went earlier, talked about earlier, are all these color folders. Colors are another huge part of MSMC. We have over 50 curated color palettes that I made uh, specifically for you guys to be able to like quickly uh, create beautifully uh, art-directed images. You don't have to use these color palettes. In fact, if you have your own brand colors, go for it. But these are here for you to use to quickly create something beautiful. All right, so how do we use these? Well, Cinema 4D has the ability to save color swatches in the content browser, and that's really what I've done here. I've built these and I've saved them out so that you don't have to. How do we apply them? It's pretty simple. In fact, let's just twirl down. Let's make sure we've got our plastic color selected. We do. Uh, let's just go over to the little color swatch button here in our color input. Hit that. And you're going to see here we have a bunch of color palettes. That's because I've already had a few in the scene file. But let's just pick a new one. Let Maybe let's pick this pink. All right, it's pretty in pink color palette. I'm going to drag that over here, and immediately it's added to my color palettes. And all I have to do is double click. Oops, I think I accidentally clicked off of it. There we go. All I have to do is double click to apply that color. Maybe we want to do this pink. And that green is ugly, so let's grab that green and let's pull another color from that palette, maybe this light white. So you can see how quickly you can start to audition and play with colors and really art direct your scene. Uh, and again, these are these are great and they're they're available here in swatches. They're also available in ramps. And I'm going to show you how to use these ramps in another video to really take this thing to a whole nother level and create tons of variation with very, very simple uh, scene files, simple setups. We have color washes and then uh, yeah, just tons of really cool colors. Uh, so that's all meant to work in conjunction with these materials. In fact, it also works with the pattern uh, gold. So this one, as I was saying earlier, has the ability to do the same thing, only this is going to layer gold behind it. So let's go ahead and grab maybe a different one. Let's grab this guy, and we'll throw this onto our shader ball. And there we have it. And again, we're going to look here. What, what's, what's yellow? Well, we've got the color of the plastic, and then we've got the pattern itself. So you can actually come in here and just navigate to, the, to a different pattern JPEG if you want. All right, so let's grab that color, and let's pick one of the colors that we just pulled in from that palette, maybe this color. Already, I love it. It's already looking good. I don't really know what else to do with that. It's, I like that. Anyway, okay, so that is um, just a brief, real brief overview. I encourage everybody to go in here and play around. We've got lots of cool materials. Uh, for you to check out and play with. Uh, and remember, anywhere you see the light yellow is something that I, I expect you to change. But again, you don't have to. You can just come in there and use as is, or you can tweak all these things if you want. All right, so uh, yeah, check out the other videos. Thanks again for picking this up, and I will see you in the next one. All right, so in this quick tip, I'm going to show you guys how to change the color of one of the MSMC materials that may not have the ability or a easy node to change the color. Don't worry, uh, there are options. And this actually goes for the Everyday Material Collection as well. If you've ever wondered, like, how do I easily change the color of a material? There's several different ways. There's actually a lot of different ways. I'm going to show you my favorite ways to do it, and you can sort of pick which one works best for you and use it in your workflow. Okay, so here we have one of the, uh, the concretes. We've got Concrete Basic on our shader ball here. We want to change the color of this concrete. The easiest way to do that is just going to be to grab that base color image. And I'm using Arnold here, but you can do the same thing in Redshift. Okay, so with that selected, you're going to come over to the image attributes, and right down here, you're going to see a, a little fly down called multiply, and that's usually going to be uh, defaulting to white. And what this is going to do is it's going to take whatever colors in the swatch and multiply it on top of your color, uh, your base color. So let's go ahead and put a little bit of tint into this concrete. Maybe we want to make it a little bit pink, or maybe we want to just like move this around and make it green, or maybe we want to make it blue. Or maybe you want to make it purple and like bring the saturation really in there. So that's probably the easiest way to do it, to add a little bit of tint and color to, to your texture. Uh, another way, and I don't really think that, you know, either way, either one of these methods is actually totally valid. But this, one's gonna, this next one's going to give you a little bit more control. So I'm just going to hit my uh, command search. And we're going to look for a ramp. And we're going to grab a ramp RGB. Cool. And I'm just going to plug this base color right into this ramp RGB into the main input. And then from there, we'll just replace that down into the color channel. There we go. So what this is doing is it's converting this RGB color into a ramp. So it's basically mapping the values of that RGB 
to this ramp. So now you can see I can easily start to clamp this just by moving these knots around. I can bring the black values way, way up. This is also handy for anywhere you want to have a real fine control over, over the texture and how it's sort of being displayed or being used maybe in one of the data channels. Okay, so we can do the same thing that we did to the other one, only this time maybe we want to add um, a couple different colors. Maybe we want to add, I don't know, this is going to look really freaky, but we're going to go ahead and do it anyway. And we'll throw blue, I guess, down in here. And what this is going to do is it's ma still mapping those values. So the very dark values of my of my texture are going to be blue and the very white values are going to be red. But as you can see, most of the values in this concrete live somewhere down here. Well, that's no big deal. We can actually just, uh, let me go ahead and uh, drag. I forget how to like select. There we go. All right, so now I can actually just go like this. And we can start to like really clamp these values down. It's so weird and bizarre and probably nothing that you would want to use in production. But hey, here it is. And let's clamp this reds down so we can start to see it come into play. Oh, yeah, there we go. So that's just yet another way to mess with the colors of MSMC materials that maybe don't have a color input. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to just leave that one there. Let's replug re that in. We'll push this off to the side. Oops, uh, what did I just do? All right, we're just going to plug this back into the color. Somehow my roughness got, okay, that's good. All right, good. Uh, wait, is that right? Base color should not be going into roughness. Roughness should go into roughness. All right, somehow we got a little messed up there. Back on track. Okay, so another way to add color is going to be doing sort of exactly what we were doing inside of the base color node. We're going to use a multiply. Let's go ahead and pull that in. And we're going to use this as our input two. And we're going to plug this right into our color. And now you can see we have the exact same effect that we had over here when we went over to the multiply. We're doing that outside of this so that we can plug in maybe our own color. Maybe we want uh, a, re a switch of some sort being driven by user data. Uh, and this is going to give us that control right here. So it's the same exact sort of thing that we were getting before. And then last, uh, well, not last, there's so, several other techniques you could do to change the color. But let's say that you have a material that already has a color that you like, but you just want to change it just a little bit. Well, in that case, you want to grab a color. If I could type color correct node, boink, let's put that in there. And put that right in between our base color and our color input. There we go. Okay, so now this is just acting like, like a color correction, right? We have gamma, we have hue shift, we have saturation. So you could, in this case, we don't have a lot of saturation in this map. It's concrete, so there's not a whole lot to it. But we could, we could add our saturation there. And then maybe we even come down here yet again to that ability to add that multiply that color. We could do that in here as well. And then we can do some nice hue shifting. Oh, wait, it doesn't work that way. Hmm, well, that makes sense because all of this stuff is happening after, or sorry, before this multiply color. So that's not going to make any difference to us for all, at all. So this method is really useful when your map already has a color on it. So let's just actually plug in. Let's say this, this concrete is actually green and we want to use the color correct node to fix that. So let's bring this back to default. Boom. All right. So now you can see we have the ability to hue shift it, increase the saturation. Uh, maybe we want to even mess with the gamma a little bit to try to get the color exactly the way we want. Maybe a little bit of contrast, something like this, get a nice pink concrete going. So that's just another way to get color to be able to edit color from one of these uh, base color images that maybe doesn't have that ability. So again, to recap, you can come into the actual base color image texture and use the multiply. You could pull it out into your own multiply and do it that way. You could also use a ramp, in which case you can have a lot of control over uh, how colors are mapped onto these values. 
And you can use the color correct node, but just keep in mind that the multiply is going to be happening uh, after the fact, not before all of this gamma hue shift stuff happens. So yeah, those are a couple different ways that I like to manipulate colors uh, with MSMC materials and with EMC as well. So I will see you in the next one. Okay, so in this video, I'm gonna walk you through the shiny ceramic uh, features in Redshift. So let's go over to our content browser and drag our MSMC ceramic shiny onto our, onto our model of our dragon. And we'll go ahead and start the IPR. And it's completely normal for Redshift to sort of take a moment when launching the IPR with any sort of bitmap uh, based materials because it's got to convert that stuff in the background, which is a bit of a drag, but it is what it is. Okay, so we've got our ceramic material applied. You can see the ceramic material is pretty cool, and I'm really excited about the ceramic material, uh, specifically because it's starting to introduce some more complicated shading techniques. Doesn't mean it's more complicated for you, the user. There's still some really uh, simple controls that you can use to get what you need out of it, but I'm excited because it's introducing some curvature and some, uh, some just advanced techniques that you'll be seeing throughout MSMC. Okay, so let's break this down. So as you may have uh, remembered, like from previous videos, that anything with a light yellow node is something that you can adjust or something that I encourage you to adjust. I encourage you to play with all the stuff, but that is the most apparent stuff. So in our case right now, if we jump on this first one, you can say it's a ceramic color. So it does the obvious thing where you can actually start to play around with the different colors of ceramic that you might want to play with. In fact, we can maybe do like a blue and make it sort of dark and maybe a little bit more towards the green, something like that. So it's very easy to control the color. And down here, the other thing that's, uh, that's yellow is the radius. So as I mentioned before, the ceramic material is driven by curvatures. So uh, in Redshift, for instance, if I grab this first one called concave curvature and I isolate that out to the surface, you're gonna see that this is gonna be representing the areas of glaze that have gathered in the crevices of our dragon. And the convex is going to be uh, representing the areas of glaze on the dragon that is the glaze is sort of pulled away from the, these external edges. You can see it right here on this mouthpiece here. So all of that is controlled with a single radius. You could, of course, break this apart and adjust the radius individually if you want. But let's go ahead and see what that looks like if we just adjust this radius to maybe like a 0.5. It just tightens up the radius of that curvature. So if we make it bigger it's gonna be a little bit more soft, right? So I'm gonna keep it at like 1.2. That's a, a, a value that I know looks pretty good. So these curvatures are driving a RS color layer node. And let's go ahead and look at the output of that. Now this RS color layer node is going to mix in these curvatures over our ceramic color. So if you look, our ceramic color is our base layer and layer one is gonna be our concave and layer two is going to be our convex. So if we were to bring, let's say, both of these down to zero, the only thing visible now is a noise that's being piped in down here just to add a little bit of variation to that color. For now, we'll leave it in. Uh, so let's bring up the layer two, which we talked about being convex. So let's bring up the opacity of that layer in our RS color layer. And this is starting to add that that base white color of our ceramic into the areas that are sort of sticking out of our dragon. If we bring that back down to something like this, then we're gonna do the same thing with layer one, which is gonna be our concave stuff, which is basically gonna darken the glaze as it pools into the crevices of our dragon. There we go, that looks pretty good. Now I might bring this guy up a little bit more to try to find the balance. And of course, this is all adjust to taste. It's like whatever you think looks good for your scene. Let's go ahead and look at the final output there. And hopefully it didn't crash. And it might have crashed. Oh, there it goes. Been having a lot of issues with Redshift not updating the IPR very well. Anyway, that seems to work. Uh, looks like it's looking pretty good. And of course, um, you've got all the other controls that you expect from one of our materials. You can jump into the rotation, the scale, the offset of the textures. You can change it to triplanar, whatever you need to do. But yeah, in a nutshell, that is the controls for the ceramic shader in Redshift. Hope you enjoyed the video, and I will see you in the next one. Hey, what's up? In this video, I wanted to walk you through one of the metal materials in the Modern Surface Material Collection, and it is going to be the sparkled 
uh, metals. You can see we have three sparkled metals. Let's actually look at this a little bit bigger here. So we have copper, silver, and gold. Uh, in this particular video, we are going to use the copper sparkly. And I'm using Redshift here, but the same techniques is actually uh, carry over into Arnold as well. Okay, so let's just bring this material in and dump it onto our shader ball here, and we'll wait for the IPR to kick in. And what this material is, is it's kind of like you sprinkled glitter all over your object, and light is just like firing off all over the place. You can see it looks very sparkly. And the reason I made this video is because you can actually layer this effect up to make some really interesting stuff. So let's go ahead and do that really quickly. I'm going to uh, reduce my bump map uh, height scale down to maybe like 0.5 just to bring that effect down a little bit. And then I'm gonna jump into the Sparkled Master uh, material here and jump over to coding. And I'm gonna bring my coding all the way up to one and we're gonna change our coding BRDF uh, to GGX and I'm gonna change the IOR to 1.52, something like that. So what I'm doing is I'm actually creating a little bit of a layered texture. Let's bring our base color, we're gonna bring our base color down a little bit, just so that we can start to see some of those reflections in there. Let's make this a little bit bigger, a little easier to see. So now you have, imagine like you have a, uh, it's almost like car paint. You've got like a glittery uh, bottom coat with a very glossy top coat. And if you start to layer up these sparkly materials, you can get some really interesting stuff. Let's just bring this down, the bump down maybe to like 0.3. That feels pretty good. And we'll go ahead and bring the base color texture, color multiplier down a little bit more. Just trying to see a little bit more of our environment in there. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. We could come in here and in the base properties, uh, tweak the reflection down, uh, but I don't wanna do that. I'm gonna actually leave that, um, the metalness rather th through this. It's doing a pretty good job just by adjusting the color multiplier. If we bring this all the way down, uh, you're gonna see we get just a little bit of that color, that copper sparkle coming through and we can just sort of adjust this to taste. That's pretty good. Something like that. Yeah, I'm vibing on that. Or you can go fully, you know, crazy with it and turn it up really high, which in case, in that case, uh, does that sort of a thing. And if we bring this all the way down to the bottom, and then we bring our bump map input and go to the tight scale of uh, maybe like a one, that's going to make the entire thing more sparkly. And I probably want to do like a 0.4 something like that. And now I can go back into, and it's really about just playing around. I just wanted you guys to see that you could play around with this stuff to make it do what you want it to do. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. I dig that. Let's make this a little bit bigger, a little easier to see. Yeah, so that is just uh, one way to use the sparkly uh, metallics. And of course, you know, you can use it however you want. You can go crazy with it. Do whatever the heck you want. But yeah, very interesting shader. All right, uh, I will see you in the next one. Okay, so in this video, I'm gonna show you how to use MSMC and Redshift, and we are gonna use some user data information to drive the colors of this cloner object. Uh, all these different shader ball tops are gonna get a different color from one of our MSMC color palettes. And we're gonna do that by using uh, a technique that I like to use in Redshift to get a little bit more of like a pseudo random uh, quality thing going on. So um, we're not gonna need to do too much to the object, no tags or anything like that. We're gonna start in our shader graph. We've just got a simple MSMC plastic cross grid pattern applied to all these different clones. And we're just gonna jump into our shading network and drop down a user data. And we're gonna do color user data in this case. And over to the attribute name, we're gonna come over to the objects and choose geometry ID color. Now what this is gonna do is it's gonna randomly assign, well, I shouldn't say randomly, it's a pseudo random color value uh, attached to every object. But there are some caveats with this method. So in Redshift, you cannot use a different instance mode uh, beyond instance. Like if you use render instance, it's not gonna work. It's gonna think all of these objects are the same object. Same thing goes with multi-instance. That doesn't work either. So this has to be, this method has to have uh, the instance mode of instance. 
So now that we've got some like pseudo random colors going on, we do want to make sure that we convert them to linear because we're going to be using them in a data flow. So let's go ahead and drop down a color correction. And we're going to put this right into the input and we're going to call this one. We're going to give it a gamma 2.2. All right, there we go. Let's look at the output of that. Now we've got something we can work with. We're going to drop this into a range because basically what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, I'm going to take the value of what you've got going on here, not the color, but the value. And so imagine if we like looked at it like this. That's kind of what we're going to be taking. We're going to be taking this value and remapping it onto a ramp. So let's grab a range. And there we go. And the range is just going to be here for a trick I like to use to kind of favor one end of the graph over the other. We're not going to really use it right away. So if I just look at the output of that, we're not going to see too much of a difference. I mean, we did because we, we have this uh, the gamma here. Let's look, at, let's look at the full RGB here. Okay, so now we can take a ramp, drop that down, plug this into the input of the ramp, and let's zoom in a little bit so we can actually click on stuff a little bit easier. Okay, there we go. Now let's drop our ramp into our plastic color. And I'll also publish this out to the surface. Okay, now we can come over to our content browser. And I'm just going to navigate to where I have my MSMC color ramps. And with that ramp selected, I'm just going to drag. I'm just going to drag any one of these that I would like to preview. Let's try this one. And there we go. Now we're getting somewhere. And maybe let's try a darker one. There we go. And you just want to make sure that you're getting a, a pretty decent mix of this. Because this is like a pseudo random value, uh, there's no way to change the seed. It's a bit limited in that way. Like you can't change the seed of this, which is a bit of a drag the way you can in Arnold. So you just kind of have to deal with that. Um, the other thing too is you can try to like, okay, bypass the uh, the linear eyes, but then you can see everything starts to like basically favor the bottom part or, or towards this middle bottom of the graph. We're not seeing any of the orange coming in because nothing is going white. Now, that's why we have this change range in here. You can actually start to favor one end of this ramp over the other if we just start to tweak this down, like maybe make that 0.7. We're just basically clamping that down. Or we can bring things further up. It's not updating very well. Redshift IPR is acting a little weird. Okay, yeah, there we go. So you can use this change range to sort of expand out your graph, or sorry, your ramp, to get whatever sort of effect that you're after. I'm just going to put this all back to default, though. So, um, yeah, that's another way to get some random qualities. Uh, let's go ahead and look at the output here. I'm just going to look at all, look at the entire shading network. Great. And if we zoom out, we can start to add even more clones, maybe do like 10 by 10. Give it a moment. Hopefully we just didn't kill it. And there you go. Now you've got a ton of random shader ball tops, all using one material, which is great. So yeah, this is just yet another cool way to get some mileage out of these MSMC ramps and some techniques here in Redshift to make that a little bit easier. Be sure to check out all the other videos showing the advanced techniques and using these color, uh, these color palettes. And I hope you enjoyed this one, and I'll see you next time. Okay, so in this video, I'm going to show you how to use MSMC and Redshift and some cool techniques. This one is going to be about using object IDs to drive colors from the MSMC color palette onto your Redshift materials. Uh, we've got a pretty simple setup here. We've got five shader ball tops in a cloner. We've got a uh, MSMC uh, plastic pattern. We've got plastic cross grid, and we need to use our, our color palettes from MSMC into this scene. And I want each one of these shader ball tops to have a different color off of that gradient. 
So uh, what do we need to do? The first step we need to do is actually, I'm gonna just delete these. We're gonna start from scratch. We need to put Redshift tags on all of these objects. I'm just gonna grab all my objects, go down to the Redshift tags and say Redshift object. Then all I need to do is select all those tags, go over to the Object ID tab and override, turn the override for Object ID on. It's gonna make all of them, uh, give them all the object ID of zero, so we don't want that. We wanna change this to num, which is going to give it zero, one, two, three, four. So that's gonna be five different object IDs right there. So we're gonna take this integer and use it in the shader to drive uh, color being selected by the position knots of a ramp. So how do we get that data over? We're gonna just do our command search in Redshift here and do a search for user data. And because this is gonna be integer, we probably want an integer user data. And I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit. And we are going to go over to the attribute name. We could type it or we could just do this little twirl down here and find object ID, or you can come down to objects, object ID. All right, there we go. If we go ahead and publish this to the surface, let's go ahead and do that. Um, what is going on here? Weird. Uh, publish to the surface. Why aren't you publishing to the surface? Weird. Okay, well, I, I think it worked, but I don't see any connection. Oh, it is there, but weird. It's doing very something very strange. Okay, well, hopefully that'll just correct itself, but yeah, it's some strange redshift stuff. Um, but right now, this data is not really going to mean a whole lot to us because we need to uh, get it into a ramp. So let's grab a range because we need to change the range of this because we are giving it the, we are basically saying zero through four. We need to remap this range from zero to four to zero to one. Let's look at the output of that. Okay, there we go. All right, now we've got something that we can work with. Uh, let's grab a ramp next. Ramp, boom, drop that in, put this into the input of the ramp. Let's take a look at this. And now we're gonna basically have, it, we're gonna see the same thing that we just saw before because we just got this black and white ramp. Let's go over to our content browser and go under wherever you have uh, your MSMC materials. Let's go to the color ramps and let's split this out into its own thing here. Maybe drop it right here is fine. And give ourselves a little bit more room. There we go. Now we can just drag over this uh, ramp and we just get we just get the coolness. We get to audition all these cool color palettes. Ooh, that one's nice. All right, so let's plug this into our plastic color right here. And now let's output the entire thing. And there we go. And now what this allows you to do is it allows you to, uh, throughout your scene, choose which object is going to get what color. For instance, if we grab these two and we say we want those to be all two or maybe we want them to be all zero and then these guys are going to be one. We can really dial in what we're after. And you can do this uh, across many, many objects in your scene. Uh, so it's very, it comes in very handy. Uh, in fact, let's just go back to num so that they all pop in the correct way. And of course, you know, it's, it's, a, it's just another sort of time saver, si saving method. Uh, and it also allows you to get some complexity where there really isn't any. So this is all one material, but we're using this ramp to make it look like we have five materials. Yeah, so this is how to use object ID to select uh, colors from the MSMC color palette ramps. I hope you enjoyed the video. I will see you in the next one. Okay, so in this video, I'm gonna show you how to use fields and Redshift and the MSMC color palettes to uh, drive different colors on all of these clones with one of these plastic, these cool, cr this, I guess I'm using plastic cross grid, but it could, you could use any of these actually. So, all right, let's dive in here. What do we got going on? We've got our cloner here and we're gonna need to create the good old trusty plane effector. So let's go up to the effector, grab a plane effector, and we'll dive into this plane effector. And we're gonna change the parameter and turn off position. We don't want position, what we do want is fields color, which is already on. And from there, I'm gonna create a falloff. Let's create a sphere. 
And we're not seeing anything yet. That's because we haven't actually pulled this data into our Redshift material yet. So let's grab that material and let's pull in that data. So we're gonna grab some user data. And in our case, we're gonna use color user data. And the attribute name, we've got this little fly out here. We're just gonna choose MoGraph color because we're gonna be pulling the display color off of this MoGraph object and into Redshift. Let's go ahead and publish this out to the viewport or to the surface rather. Under the field, the spherical field, under color remap, you're gonna see here, actually, let me grab this again. We, I think we actually need to turn on color. Yep, that's all good. All right, let's go ahead and change this guy. Make sure this guy is actually fields color. Maybe I need to refresh. I should be seeing a color here. MoGraph color. Yep. Hmm. All right, well, let's just try this. I'm just going to go into color remap and remap this to a gradient. And cool. All right, well, oh, that, duh. Everybody's yelling at the monitor, probably. It might help if I actually pulled my uh, spherical uh, field out. That was my silly mistake. Okay, so now you can see we're able to control all of this, all of this uh, uh, user data down here. Uh, our field is basically driving this gradient. This gradient's getting pulled into into Redshift via the color user data node, and we're going to use this to pull colors off of our gradient. Now we could do this a couple different ways. We could, if we wanted to, keep it all in the shader and then, in fact we'll just do that really quickly here we could just remap this we'll just grab a ramp we could just remap this data right into a ramp and let's just look at the output of that and this is just basically going to give us one to one there's nothing different that we're doing here but we are going to jump into our content browser and navigate to where we have our msmc materials and we're going to dive into the ramps and these ramps are what we're going to use down here on this ramp. So let's just go ahead and click on this ramp and we can plug in any ramp that we want at this point. And you can see now we're able to control this via this ramp, which is kind of cool. Now, um, it does need to have, uh, I believe the gamma is incorrect, but that's fine. For right now, we're just going to leave it right there because I'm going to show you the other method, a method that I think is probably more in line with what I would do. Let's get rid of that ramp. And that's to put this ramp directly into the spherical field. So let's do that same thing. But you can see here, it looks weird, right? It doesn't look quite correct. That's because we need to give it the old 2.2 gamma. So let's grab a color. Oops. Color. Correct. Oh man, I cannot spell and I just accidentally deleted that. All right, there we go. All right, we're gonna plug this into our input. Let's go ahead and look at the output of that into the surface. And with that node selected, let's change its gamma to 2.2. And there we have it. Now we can uh, control where and how these colors are being applied using fields, which is pretty cool. Uh, and you can see we've got the center being yellow and then it comes out to the pink. And at any point we can come in here and just change this and drag in a new color, something like that. So this method actually becomes really powerful, uh, not because you can control it, but also because of the, uh, the implications in a, in a random sort of workflow. If you watch the other video that I put together where we're using the geo ID uh, like it's a pseudo random color uh, user data available in Redshift. Uh, but the problem with it is it's pseudo random. You can't change the seed. You can't really do much with it. It is what it is. In fact, it doesn't even work if I were to use a uh, method other than instance. It wouldn't work. What's great about using fields, this new method, is that we can use multi instance, which is going to make the entire scene much faster. Okay, so let's do that. Let's grab our uh, plane effector. We're going to go over to fall off. I'm going to turn off the spherical field, and we're going to turn on a random field. And the random field right off the bat isn't going to do anything until I turn on the color. So now you can see we're getting a random color, and we can change the seed. Look at that. we got changing seeds. This is awesome. 
All right, we, need, we do need to convert this to the colors that we want, which is going to happen right here. We're saying gradient, and then we can just do the same method. We can just plop that right in there, and we are good to go. And the best part about it is that we can come up here at any point, come into our field and change the seed, which is really nice. All right, let's look at how that looks all the way out onto my surface. Uh, let's go ahead and plug that into the plastic color. Great. And maybe we try a slightly different color option. Let's do something maybe more colorful. There we go. Yeah, so this is just another way to handle that. Now, obviously, this exact same workflow uh, will work for you in any of the patterns, or actually anywhere uh, that you that you think you might want to have a bunch of different random colors assigned to a bunch of clones. But let's try something else. Let's do let's grab one of our metal patterns. Let's do gold, and we'll use maybe let's just go into a icon mode so I can just see this a little bit better. And make that a little tinier. And let's grab this one, pull that in. We'll assign this to our material or to our shader top, shader ball top. And now we've got this cool, let's zoom in here a little bit. We can see that a little bit better. We've got our cool gold happening with the plastic. Now we want to actually use that same method to drive the color on this material as well. So let's do something a little bit different. Let's grab an, a redshift uh, material, and I'm just going to leave it pretty it's actually going to be down here i'm going to kill off the material itself we're going to go into that original uh, material that we had before and we are going to use some referencing so let's push this we're copying our color user data which is pulling in the field colors and our color correct node i'm just copying that i'm going to paste it into this material and we just got to find it there it is all right we're going to pipe this out to the surface there you go now I can reference that into this other material. In fact, we'll just call this color ref. It's not necessarily that you have to do this, but it's just, it's a cool technique. I figured I would show it. So we just drag this in to our material. It's going to create a reference. Actually, I take that back. That's going to be how Arnold does it. In here, you actually select it this way. All right, so that reference is selected. Now all we have to do... Oops, what did I just do? Uh, that is not what I meant to do. I meant to grab this guy and say ref rinse. Go ahead and select color ref. And we're going to drop that right into the plastic color. And there you go. Now you've got a nice reference here. And just so you know, the reference, you can actually pipe out any aspect of that, any uh, output of that material. And now we can come into this color ref and we can change things around if we want to. We can get all, uh, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense for this workflow because the random field is really what's driving all of this, not, not necessarily this color ref. But hey, it's here and I wanted to show it to you because referencing stuff is a really great way to, uh, to make things uh, efficient. All right, let's jump into that random field and maybe change, zoom out, let's zoom way out here and change our seed there we go cool yeah so i hope you've checked out all the other videos showing advanced techniques of randomizing and working with these color palettes in uh, redshift uh hope you enjoyed the video and i will see you in the next one hey what's going on everybody in this video i'm going to show you how to create custom user data on your objects to drive the color of your MSMC pattern material using our color palettes that we have in, in the MSMC. So uh, what do we need to do first? Well, we need to set up some user data on maybe this top one first, and then we're gonna use that integer user data in our shader to drive our color. So let's get started. We've got our first shader ball top selected. We're gonna go under user data and say manage user data. We're going to add data, and we're going to give it a name of maybe uh, color. Uh, we'll do MSMC color. And we're going to change our data type to integer. And I'm going to use the cycle button. It's one of the ones I like to use. We don't, we don't have to use it, but you can use whichever one you prefer. I'm going to go with this one. We're going to negative 1, semicolon, color 1. 
zero, semicolon, color two, and so on. Okay, once we're done typing it all in, all we have to do is hit enter, and you can see we have our cool drop down where we can choose one through five of the colors in our MSMC color palette ramp. Okay, so that's all set up. We named it MSMC uh, space color. I think I am going to change this name just to make it a little bit easier. I'm going to get rid of any spaces, and then I'm just going to make it a lowercase c. And I'm just going to copy this and hit OK. And now if I come over to my shader that I've applied to all of these shader ball tops, I can just come over to the uh, open field here and hit my search and I'm going to look for user data. And we know this is integer, so we're going to do that. And we're just going to paste the name right in there. And then all we have to do is drive this into a range. And again, we know that we picked numbers uh, 0 through uh, 4. At least, uh, yeah, I believe so. Actually, I should double check that user data because I believe it was going negative one. Yeah, and we don't want that. So I'm going to change this to zero, one, two, just to make it easier, three and four. Okay. Now uh, we should be able to range this from 0 to 4 out to 0 to 1. So we're basically saying we'll take that data and put it into a form of 0 to 1. Let's grab a ramp. We're going to use this change range to pipe right into our input of our ramp. And let's go ahead and look at the output of this. And as of right now, all of them are sharing. Uh, none of them have this user data yet, just that top one. So they're all going to be black right now. But if we were to change this user data to, let's say, 3, uh, maybe or maybe not. Okay, so what ended up happening was the, uh, the viewport was just not updating this properly. Uh, I did change the user data, as you can see, to be called MSMC, just to make it easier. So that user data now is called uh, MSMC. And it wasn't updating, but now it seems to be updating. So we've got two, we've got three, we've got four, and we've got five. Okay, so now that can go into this ramp. Let's go into our content browser and find our MSMC color ramps. And we're going to just drag these ramps right onto our ramp. And everything's working as we would expect it to, but we need to copy this user data onto these other objects. So I'm going to go into Manage User Data. I'm going to right-click our little, our little guy here, copy that, hit OK. I'm going to grab this one and say Paste User Data, OK. I'm going to grab this one and say Paste User Data. Oops. Yep, good. Hit OK. Do the same one here. And then last but not least, we're going to paste this one. Okay, so now let me just refresh this and let me make sure these are selecting properly. Okay, that is. All right, so for whatever reason, Redshift um, just needs, I guess, to be, these need to be changed for it to actually kick in, which is a little annoying, but whatever. Okay, so now we've got them all set up. Let's put this out into our plastic color and let's look at the output of our shader here. And now we can just come over to our ramp and drag in any ramp we want. There we go. All right. So what's great about this method? Well, this method is not, it, it's very, it's very different. It has to, it, it's a bit more restricted than the other methods because you actually have to copy and paste user data around, which is a little bit more difficult than, let's say, just adding a tag to a hierarchy. Uh, but it is interesting, and it gives you this cool little fly down. So if at any point you're like, oh, I just want this one to be four, and I want this one to be four, and maybe I want this one to be four. But what stinks is like sometimes it just chooses to not update, and then you just have to like 
kick it in the butt, but it seems to be updating pretty good now. And of course you can grab all of them and change to uh, one color if you want, which is nice too. Just another way to do it. All right, so let's get back to where we were. This is gonna be one, this one's gonna be two, this one's gonna be three already, and this will be four, this one will be five. So that is just yet another way to use the MSMC color uh, palettes, in our case the ramps, with custom user data and getting more out of these materials. Uh, so yeah, uh, check out the other videos. Hope you enjoyed this one, and I will see you in the next one. Okay, so in this video, we're going to use Redshift and MSMC and some pretty clever tricks with fields, reference materials, all kinds of fun stuff in this one to get multiple color variations out of your MSMC materials using our color palettes, but also to be able to pull in random patterns from the patterns uh, folder. So this one, we're gonna, we're gonna get all sorts of cool looks out of one shader, which is really fun. A lot, of, a lot of cool techniques in this one. So let's dive in. Okay, so we've got a cloner. We've got our shader ball top. We've got one of our gold uh, layered materials in here with this cool like swirly pattern on it. In fact, if I zoom out, we got a lot of clones in here, but I zoomed in so you can sort of see the pattern a little bit better. All right, the first thing we need to do is get some random user data out of this system, out of this MoGraph system. So we're gonna do that with a trusty old plane effector. So go over to effector, grab a plane effector. In our case, we're not gonna use any of the position, but we are gonna use the field's color, which it's already set to. And we're gonna go under fall off and we're gonna choose random. Make sure that you turn on your little color wheel so that we're getting color in here as well, some random color. All right, so now you're thinking, do I put that, do, are we gonna drop by user data into this uh, gold layered material shader graph? No, we're gonna create a new one. So we're gonna go over to create, we're gonna create a reference material. So we're gonna grab a material in Redshift here, and I'm just going to delete the material itself, leaving the output there. And I'm gonna type in user data color, that's fine. And let's go over to the little twirl down over on the attribute name and change this to MoGraph color. The other thing I'm gonna do is assign this to our shader ball so we can see exactly what we're doing. Let's publish this out to our surface. There we go. All right, we're getting some random color information. That's looking good, but I wanna convert that to linear. So let's go ahead and grab a color correct node and pop that in, changing the gamma to 2.2, there we go. Let's look at that output. All right, so now we've got some color, some user data color coming in, and we can come over to this random field, and what's great is we can just change the seed and it's gonna update randomly right there. So what do we do next with this thing? Well, this one is strictly gonna be for grabbing our colors, so I'm gonna push this right into a ramp. And let's go ahead and look at that input and we're going to push this right out to the surface as such and let's just zoom out so we can see all of our objects there now we can grab one of our we'll go into our content browser and grab one of the msmc color palettes we're going to grab the ramps pull this off into its own content browser here make this a little bit smaller now we can just drag this on there and see what we're getting all right, cool, let's try maybe this one. I'm not necessarily seeing a ton of the light pink, which leads me to believe that we might wanna tweak our, we might wanna create a, uh, a range just so that we can control this a little bit better. We're gonna push the range in here. We're basically gonna say, all right, I want to consider 0.9 to be black and maybe 0.1 to be white. So now we're just getting a little bit less, uh, we're getting a little bit more of the ends of these of this ramp. So we can come over here to the ramp. Okay, so now we got, we got our color happening. It's not quite, it's pretty good. Yeah, I think it's grabbing all the right colors. Let me see. I do see some values in here that are interesting and sort of not quite right which is a little concerning, but I'm not gonna worry too much about it right now. 
I just want to make sure. Okay, that's looking fine. I mean, there's a couple values in there that are a little outside of this range, but that's fine. We can we could probably change that if we just go like this. Bring this back down to normal. And again, it's pulling in some colors that I'm not really sure about. Let's go into our random field and make sure that we're going to remap this with a gradient and make sure that it's black to white. I think that is probably where I was going wrong. Yeah, it appears like that is exactly what I was doing wrong. Okay, so now we should be getting a lot closer to where we want to be. Yep, and we definitely want to use that gamma shift. And all right, so right now, good. So I'm just trying to make sure that we're getting a good balance across this gradient, which we are. Okay. So again, just to recap on this section, we changed the field uh, to random, or we made a random field. We changed the color mapping uh, from no remap to gradient, black to white. You definitely have to linearize this. So we linearized it, and we are using this as our ramp. Let's just rename this color, okay? So this is gonna come in handy later, not right at the moment, but we will use it in a little, in a little bit. We're gonna duplicate this. I'm just holding down control and dragging. We're going to re rename this one pattern, and this one's going to be really interesting because we're going to take this color user data, and we're going to linearize it, yep, and then we're going to change its range, but we're not going to feed it into a ramp. We're actually going to feed it into a multi-shader. So this is the multi-shader inside of uh, Redshift, and the multi-shader is basically a good way to load an entire folder of images and then index them uh, using this index input right here, it's going to expect an integer to basically choose what image it's going to publish out. Okay, so in a nutshell, uh, we are going to feed in an entire folder of patterns from uh, MSMC, which you're going to have to go ahead and split out. In fact, let me just show you that. I went ahead and split out all of the JPEGs from the MSMC patterns material into its own folder. And the reason you want to do that is because the MSMC Patterns folder contains JPEGs and .tx files. And the .tx files are strictly for Arnold. So pull the JPEGs into a separate folder. I just named it Pattern for, for uh, Ramp Redshift. And then select it. And what that's going to do is it's going to load all 52 patterns into this node. Okay? It's going to expect an index number. So if we were to actually, uh, let's just go ahead and put this as the shader on our shader ball top, and we'll throw the pattern out to the out to the surface. And let's just zoom in here a little bit so we can see what we got cooking. So now, if you notice, if I grab that multi shader, if I change this uh, index, I can just start to audition different patterns. But I don't want to do this by hand. I don't want to have to like sit there and create a bunch of these copies of these and offset these by hand. I want to do it randomly. I've already got the data. I've already got the user data. I've already got the change range. All we have to do now is change this range, which is going to be mapping something from 0 to 1. And we know we have 52 of these. We have 52 slots. So we're going to change the range. Instead of from 0 to 1, we're going to output it. We're going to convert 0 to 1 to 0 to 51. And you're saying, why did he say 51 and not 52? Because we're starting at zero. So let's push that change range into there, and boom, it's working. Don't really have to. That's a magic trick right there. Uh, let's go into our random field, come over here. We can now change our seed, and we're going to get a completely different pattern every time. Although a few of these are maintaining. You just got stubborn ones, I guess. All right, let's zoom out. And now we've got a bunch of random patterns. We've got one, we're going to have one material that's going to have pulling random colors from our cool color palettes. And it's going to be pulling a random uh, pattern from our pattern library. Okay, so let's jump back into our main shader and let's delete these two shaders off of our shader ball top. Now, all we have to do is use some fancy references. If you haven't used references in Redshift, uh, or in Arnold, whichever your flavor, they are fantastic. They're a great way to keep your graphs clean and uh, keep data uh, centralized so that you can reuse it again and again. So we're going to type reference, and it's going to basically ask you, okay, what node or what material do you want to reference here? I'm going to reference color. Oops, for some reason it's very sensitive 
select it. Let's do color. All right, we're going to push this into the color of our orange plastic or our layered gold plastic. And there we go. All right, it's so already working. We're pulling in that. Okay, so now we're just going to come down here and we're going to reference that pattern material that we made. Oops, duh. Ref. All right, so now we can also do it like this. We can just drag that in there as well if we don't want to have to deal with that. And we're going to push this out to the blend. And there we have it. And let's go ahead and close that. And let's zoom in so we can see all the cool stuff that we've got going on. Cool. So now we've got a random pattern and random colors, not truly random colors, because we're, we, we're art directing these colors using our our uh, our ramps over here. Let's go ahead and actually didn't mean to kill that because we want to pull that up for this. Let's dive into our color reference material. And now we can just come into the ramp and we can audition any color combination that we want. Maybe something dark to really show off the gold or maybe something bright. I'm going to find something. I know there's one in here that I like using with the gold. I think it's this guy. Yeah, that looks good. And of course, you can just come over here and hit the random seed on that field to get a completely different look. Pretty cool. Now we have a lot of variants happening with one object and one shader. In fact, let's just really expand these out and get a lot in here. And again, you can just random seed. And what's great is that because we split these out into their own materials as references, you can use these again and again in other materials, which is really great. So you could throw it into one of the copper uh, materials, pattern materials, or maybe just one of the plastic ones if you want. But there are a lot of options that you can, you can use. And it's very, very powerful. Let's just zoom in here and get a nice look at that again. Yeah, cool stuff. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, be sure to check out all the other videos showing how to use the, uh, the MSMC color ramps and color swatches and different techniques of getting a lot out of this material pack. Hope you enjoyed the video, and I will see you in the next one.